Number 10, Hedgehog. I bet all the things you thought people ate back then, you weren't expecting Hedgehog. I know I wasn't. This is medieval times, however, and sometimes food ran short. Sometimes you gotta do things you wouldn't normally do, and that includes eating a poor hedgehog. It starts by ending the life of a porcupine or hedgehog via the neck. Ooh, gross. Singeing all of those protective spy needles, gutting the poor little guy where it was then boiled so it would naturally unravel because you know they're always rolled up. Uh, alternatively, you could bake them in clay for that Hannibal experience. Sonic be nimble, Sonic be quick, but that quick enough to avoid our appetites. It's kind of sick. I don't know, I couldn't think of a rhyme there. It's just gross. People eating hedgehogs, man, come on. Number nine, kitty. Honestly, I was a little surprised by this one. No, not because it is a cat. Obviously, in Western society like ours, kitties are pets, and they're just decent animals. I can accept that other cultures, and in the past, Folks were different. It's what they do. There's nothing wrong with that. However, cats kind of have an interesting history. A lot of times, they're associated with bad luck or misfortune. And not just black cats, but cats in general. Medieval times were weird. So I'm surprised that they would even try and eat one. According to one medieval recipe, it involves removing the head because that's not for eating. Obviously, should have known that. It was thought that the cat brains could make you lose your judgment. I'd argue at that point we'd already lost our judgment, but okay. The next step is simple. You bury it in the ground for a night because that's what you do, and then you boil it in a broth with garlic. Uh, I love garlic and broth just as much as the next guy, I just, I don't know if that's the recipe I'd be going for. Oh man, I'm getting sick already. Number eight, beavers. Nice beaver. Thanks, I just had it stuffed. Huh, naked gun anybody, huh, no? I love Leslie Nielsen movies, what can I say? One day folks, I promise I'll be there. Speaking of Canadian icons, Beavers. It's my national animal, and if you end up on fairgrounds, you can almost bet you will find a vendor selling fried beaver tails. The northern states will know what I'm talking about, but for the southern and western states, who for sure eat this, but have a different name for it, it's, it's fried dough. It's not actually an actual beaver tail. Beaver tails are delicious, especially with a Nutella spread. Oh, that's my favorite. The hot Nutella, it's beautiful. However, in medieval times, beavers were quite popular. It makes more sense than you think. They were already valuable for their furs, and apparently well, they were sought after for the round boys. You know what I'm talking about? <coughs> Cough here. The trend of gotta do what you gotta do is gonna come up a lot on this list. That's just kind of how things go. There's an animal, you're gonna eat it. Just, that's it. Number seven, BYOF. If you're passing by one of these middle-aged taverns, maybe you feel like grabbing some questionable lunch. Well, you better come prepared, my friend. Bring your own fork, because we don't have any. We can't afford that. We're not blacksmith, we can't make a fork. What's a fork? We didn't have a moody server sitting in booth 11 doing roll-ups all night. This was the Middle Ages. If you had a fork, you took care of that fork. Forks don't grow on trees, pal. If you were lucky, these establishments would dish out a couple of spoons. Maybe a couple of spoons, but forks? Nice joke. You're getting laughed at. You're watching everybody eat while you start. Historians compared sharing forks to sharing toothbrushes, so that's, in case you're wondering, no, you're not borrowing a friend's. Oh, after you've done that bike, can I just maybe, no, get out of here, see ya, off with your head. You also didn't have a steak knife handy ever. Knives were only reserved for carvers. Until the 17th century, all you had were little daggers. You would just poke and tear through your meal. You would just poke it. Number six, ins and outs. My favorite title. I've worked here for a year and a half now, it's my favorite title. When we think of a medieval tavern or an inn, it's important to note the differences. Yes, there's drinking. Yes, it smells like dad breath all throughout the air. But inns, their sole purpose was to house travelers comfortably. Whereas the tavern, not so much housing, more of rough housing, you know what I mean? Taverns were almost a private event thing. Your neighbors would whip up some ale, light a candle, two is a company, three is a crowd, come on in, now we got a basement tavern fight club, let's party. It was that easy, that was a tavern, you now have a tavern. No license, no nothing, just come on in, look what I made, drink it. Number five, license to pour. We got inns, we got taverns, so what else? Where can we get a pint in the 1500s? I am thirsty. Well, come the time of King Henry VII, these establishments were known as pubs. I know, I'm jumping ahead here a little bit, but this is the perfect time to talk about some early pub history. Why not, just squeeze it in. By 1577, there were over 17,000 alehouses, 3,000 inns, 500 taverns, all throughout Old England. So that's one pub for every 200 people. That is so much ale. That's, oh my gosh, do they work here too? This is a lot. So in order for this to take off, an act was passed in 1552. 
Innkeepers needed a license, so you can no longer throw a sleeping bag down, make some questionable wine in your cellar, and then call it an inn. That's not how it works. That's We're not doing that. We're not going to your basement and sleeping and drinking your ale. It's not gonna fly anymore. Show me some license. <laughs> Show me some licenses. -es. Number four, cherry brandy. Okay, it doesn't matter if you're a noble or a knight or whatever, everybody wants to go to the pub and loosen up, especially a young Prince Charles. Back in the day, he would often visit the local Stornoway Harbor Village pub. So yeah, you would walk up, sit next to a prince and be like, hi, can I buy you a drink? What's going on here? He would often order from the bartender in a soft voice, a cherry brandy. This prince was being discreet, but unfortunately a local reporter just happened to be sipping some crispy cold ones at the same time and overheard this guy getting his whistle wet. So now it was of course a huge scandal. A prince drinking, having fun? Number three, humble pie. I'll cut the brass tacks on this one. I've never had venison before, but I hear it's good. I'm willing to try it. I like trying new things then I can say no, you know? However, the entrails of a deer and other wild animals baked into a pie? Uh, that I'm not too sure of, I, I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm thinking about a big greasy chef who's using his bare hands, which most likely haven't been washed, and he's pounding guts into the pie like a jackhammer. The sounds, the smells, and well, it just doesn't taste good in my imagination. However, this one was quite common. It was a very common dish in medieval times. I don't know why, but it was. Can you imagine eating a Entrail pie, oh, that must be awful. Number two, chicken beer. This one's great, you guys are gonna love this one. Beer, the elixir of life. It's how Homer Simpson functions, and honestly, I don't blame him. It makes sports fun, and watching reality TV shows when you're forced to, enjoyable. Beer is no modern invention, and it's Hoppy roots can be found in ancient times. However, the Middle Ages were no different. There's lots of beer back then, thank God. However, let's take a look at uh, a different recipe, if you will. This one includes raisins, mace, nutmeg, dates, and a boiled chicken beaten like a tough cut of meat. All of these ingredients were then put into a canvas bag and left to steep until fermentation took place. Now doesn't that sound like you just wanna pop the caps of a couple of those bad boys? Boiled chicken beer? <laughs> yes please. More like no thanks. That sounds awful. Boiled chicken beer, god damn. And coming in the number one spot today, we have Lamprey. Wait till the editor pulls up a picture of these bad boys. Hideous, ugly fish with lots of little sharp teeth around a suction cup mouth, perfect for sucking blood. They're blood suckers. While you cover up your wrist, medieval people love these little devils. This was also thought of as a delicacy. King Henry I loved them so much, in fact, well, it actually might have been his undoing. He ate too many of them, apparently. Gross. Stay off the leeches, guys. If anything, stay off the leeches. They're gross. Don't, don't. Mm -mm. No. Number 10, Treaty of Verdun. The Treaty of Verdun, or also known as Traite de Verdun, was a contract agreed on in August 843 in which divided the Frankish Empire into three kingdoms among the surviving sons of the Emperor Louis I. The firstborn son and heir of Charlemagne. Long story short, all the grandsons were all at civil war with each other about who was getting what, what did Grant promise. The treaty followed shortly after almost three years of wars between the brothers. It was the first in a series of partitions contributing to the dissolution of Charlemagne's empire, and it is seen as a blueprint in which modern societies are based off of. Basically, the brothers all had to split what their grandfather had decreed his own into land. Lothair, the first, coolest name, Charlemagne's eldest son, received Francia Media, or the Middle Frankish Kingdom. Louis II received Francia Orientalis, or the East Frank Kingdom, and Charles II received Francia Occidentalis, or the West Frankish Kingdom. You and I both know the youngest got the most. Come on, I'm just gonna say it right out. Everyone likes to talk about the eldest son this and the eldest son that, but we all know the baby gets whatever they want whenever they want, don't they, huh? I'm looking at you, Taylor. Come here, man. It's true, man. The baby gets everything. Middle child. This guy didn't even exist growing up. Didn't hear from him. Number nine, Underground Castle. Big Chet and I are currently replaying Ocarina of Time, so in honor of Hyrule, I gotta include this medieval castle. It was once a residence during the reign of King Henry III. This castle was actually discovered recently underneath a prison yard back in 2015. The old prison castle, we love those. Shawshank Redemption 2, medieval edition. Super recent discovery. Archaeologists discovered walls of a castle underneath the basketball court in southwest England at a former prison. Yeah, dudes were shooting threes over top of kingdom and they had no idea. How amazing is that? This was the same castle that played part in the mid 1100s during England's civil war. The castle actually fell later in the 1400s and the prison was built on the grounds later in the 1700s until it closed its gates forever in 2013. And then we were shooting threes and then we discovered it, of course. If I was a ghost haunting these grounds, I would make every shot miss easily. I would just float near the net, tap the ball away, like nice try. Mm. Back to prison. Mm. Number eight, 
stonemasonry. So we all know about who wrote what and who translated what to what text and which language while writing what play, which was based on who, but who built all this stuff? When we think of the Dark Ages, we can't forget the megalithic Leviathan stones carved and molded together to create the enormous Gothic castles and cathedrals that are still standing to this day. How did people do it back then? Well, masons in medieval England were responsible for building. Masons were highly skilled craftsmen, and their trade was primarily used in the building of castles, churches, and cathedrals. There were three main classes of stonemasons. There was the apprentice, the journeyman, and the master mason. So what would a medieval construction site exactly look like? Well, of course, there's the master mason. He's usually the head and the overseer of the work, and he's the most skilled of the tradesmen. This is like the head honcho on site. We've all seen this guy walking around site. He's always angry, he's always yelling, hey, who's got the plans? You, give me those, what are these? Yeah, they're backwards, you idiot. I'm gonna put the window down there. So how did they exactly chisel out all of these castles from one giant rock? Well, they didn't. The stone had to be quarried first from quarrymen. These were not masons. Their job was to get the stone for the masons to work on out of the ground. Local stone was used first, but occasionally stone could travel vast distances, even from other countries. And so I gotta drag that boulder there all the way to Scotland? Okay. Some of the most beautiful architecture ever created can be still seen across Europe. The amount of time and skill it took for these people to have designed, constructed, and chiseled such megalithic sites still baffles me. I'd be trying to read the plan still. Oh, I s that's north. I got the... I got it, we're good. Number seven, roasted swan. This one is supposed to be a delicacy, roasted swan. You just go to the park and see those swans floating in the pond and you think to yourself, yeah, I'd like to roast and eat those birds. Kind of a weird thing to think, but okay, sure. I know swans can be aggressive, but damn, okay. Anyway, more disturbing than daydreaming about eating unusual poultry is what medieval people did to prepare swans. One recipe calls for its guts and vinegar to be used in bread making. I think we'll skip on that one. And another one where the skin is removed roasted and then the skin and feathers put back on the bird so you put it back on the dinner table for like a show and then peel it back off it's just it's strange I feel like that's not very sanitary I feel like the feathers are the dirtiest part you, you always have to remove the feathers don't you Chris I don't know it's weird number six sheep's business when you've trimmed all the meat and you're staring at an animal's piece of deal there's only one thing left to do wash it clean it stuff it with ten eggs milk fat and roast it with ginger and cinnamon Sounds yummy, honestly. I just wish it was a better, you know, cut of meat and not the sheep's meat. Like I said, it's a case of you gotta do what you gotta do. I know today there are some dishes involving the undercarriage of bulls and I hear it's good, but uh, you can't blame me if a tad skeptical. So that one was all about a sheep's is, is gabagool, you know, is, uh, is Wiener von Schnitzel Miner. Number five, garbage stew. Ever walk down the stairs and say, Mom, what's for dinner? And she says, I don't know, but pulls off whatever she's got from the fridge and the pantry and makes a great meal. Even though deep down inside, she hasn't been grocery shopping because she got into the wine, but acted as if she had everything under control when she totally didn't. Shout out to all the moms up there who do great work. You're the best. Way to go, moms. Well, that's what medieval garbage stew was, minus the whole mom part. It's a little bit of everything and anything and everything that's left over. Guts, chicken feet, leftover salt, spices, if any were available, livers. You get the point, it's kind of gross, but at some point after trial and error, you'd probably come up with something delicious, enough garlic and broth, maybe a little bit more kitty. Throw in some sheep gabagool while you're at it, why not, you know? Number four, helmeted chicken. Working nine to five is hard. It takes tough people, both blue and white collar folks with grit to wake up every morning and get the job done for their families. This is true of peasantry in medieval times. It was tough, but someone had to do it. So imagine if you would, how you would feel after grew Ruling days of work in the fields, defending your farm from foreign invaders, and maintaining a family. That's a, that's, that's a lot, of, that's a tall order. After all that, you find out that royalty have been having extravagant dinners and meals, and having meat every meal, which is kind of rare for peasants. It wasn't that common. Not only are they having meat, but they're having multiple types of meat at the same dinner, and on top of that, they're sewing poultry on top of pigs to make it look like it was a knight in a coat of arms riding into battle just like a turducken because they're bored and that's that's what a helmeted chicken was. Boredom, Ugh, crazy. People are starving outside and they're like, we should sew the chicken and the pig together. Number three, medieval taverns. Say you want to grab a pint with the local lads. Where do you get an IPA in the dark ages? Where do we get a six pack of Arthurian ale? Well, this is the medieval ages, so instead of venturing through the woods to hopefully 
Maybe find another town, just ask thy neighbor. That's right, in the Middle Ages, you could brew your own ale. No problem, no one's asking any questions. Give it a shot. In the late 12th century, baking bread was not freely permitted, but making ale in your basement was. Uh, I guess that's great. So the higher ups, the noble lords, they wouldn't care if you made ale and had a block party, but if you made a weak ale or it was improperly measured and then distributed, then and only then do you get a fine. Arrest this man at once. Number two, St. Patrick. St. Patrick was a fifth century Roman British Christian missionary and bishop in Ireland. Also known as the apostle of Ireland, although he is the first apostle, having lived prior to the current laws of the Catholic Church. He is considered a saint in the Catholic Church and is regarded as the Enlightener of Ireland. The dates of Patrick's life are not certain, but there is a consensus that he was active in Ireland during the 5th century, making his rounds as a missionary, speaking the good word of God. But let's get into what everyone talks about with this guy. The good stuff, like slamming a green Guinness or getting all the snakes out of Ireland. I mean, I love the structure and the faith and stuff, but also chasing every snake out of an entire country with a walking stick? Shoo! Shoo, you fool, you bleeding bleeder! Go! Go! Do you know how big Ireland is? St. Patrick's Day is on March 17th, the supposed date of his death in 461 AD. It is enjoyed inside and outside Ireland as a religious and cultural holiday and remains a celebration of Ireland itself. And finally, number one, Dancing plague. A medieval plague, but make it groovy. Yeah, let's start dancing. That's right, the dancing plague. This was a real danger back in 1518. I'll try not to laugh, but it's, I can't, I'll try. This was perhaps one of the weirdest events in history. Fra Trofea was the first victim of said plague. She was moving her body around frantically, so much so that it resembled a dance or something, in the middle of the Holy Roman Empire. And as if that wasn't weird already, dozens of others began to join. And then more, and then more, all moving their bodies with a similar, wacky, frantic twist. This was long before Chubby Checker came along, so we still have no idea what was going on here. Like, we're out of guesses at this point. This twist lasted for months. People were dropping on the spot. It was scary and confusing. In total, there were around 400 victims that fell to this mysterious illness. That's a lot of deaths. That's a lot of real deaths. This was documented in 16th century historical records, so I don't think the story is made up per se. No one would make this up. It's terrifying. A Catholic saint at the time, Saint Vitus, was believed to have the power to curse people with said dancing plague. What an amazing power also. Guy starts moonwalking away, you're like, beat it. Some suggest this was a cult. Others believe they ate toxic rye. Who's to say for sure? Either way, we're all dancing. Kicking off the list at number 10, the big city. Okay, it's the 14th century, it's Saturday. You and the boys are off to have a hoot and or holler. You decide to hit the big city, check out one of those medieval taverns that everybody is talking about. So, what should you expect? Should you get your fake ID? Should you have a, your passport? Is there a bouncer? What's covered tonight? How many rupees is covered? Well, for starters, this is a long time before Ubers. So unless you have a horse or two, you're gonna have to walk quite a bit just to get to the bar. If the Black Death didn't get you, the commute into the city definitely would. Your knees would be clicking. Living in the city was horrible. Strict curfews were put into place. Violent crimes would happen all throughout the night because obviously back in those days, there's no police force out patrolling. Just shady dudes and hoods. Just Big Ched would be in the corner with his hood up, just planning something, you know what I mean? Number nine, house special. Many of these ale brewers were women, probably because men were too busy drinking it. Ale and bread were both necessities when it came to living in the late 12th century, because there's no Taco Bell anywhere. This food's sparse. Hunting, it's all sparse. I like saying the word sparse, it's nice. Sparse. Baking bread was not freely permitted, but making ale in your basement was. Yeah, we went from making ale in our living rooms to banning alcohol. History is wild sometimes. So the higher ups, these noble lords, they wouldn't care if you made ale and had a block party and all that jazz and made all that noise, but if you made weak ale, or if it was improperly measured and then distributed, then you would get a fine. Imagine that. That's like the police busting your house party only when they get there, they turn the music up and congratulate you on a proper barrel of white claw. Uh, yes, black cherry, the finest. Number eight, don't mind the rats. Oh, what's that? You're with your friends and family gathering around a table, eating and drinking and conversing, having a lovely time? Ah, be a shame if hundreds of rats started to swarm your feet while you were mid-bite, wouldn't it? Welcome to the past. The plague rolled into town back in 1328 and it lasted until like 1350. It lasted a long time. It was actually horrible. We think of the plague in history and we're like, man, was that anything like the past few years? No, not at all. I haven't seen any swarms of rats lately. I haven't gotten the Black Death. The European population was reduced by one third and rats were mostly to blame. 
Yeah, these quick hairy balls of yuck just scurrying through the town. I don't want any part of that. I don't like rats. I actually do not like rats. These little guys passed it on. Mid meal, you would feel a tickle, look down. Oh, it's just the plague. Nice, just a couple of plagues waiting for crumbs to fall. Oh, how cute is that? Yeah, just the bill, thanks. Number seven, apple bobbing. In a time where bodies were literally piling up on the side of the road, I can't believe we got apple bobbing out of the whole ordeal. That's crazy. It seems like ill timing, but it is the dark ages. What can you do? Apples historically have always been a symbol of importance. The Greek golden apple started the Trojan War. Snow White's poison apple was a symbol of importance in literature and all that good stuff and growing up. And in the middle ages, apples were viewed as a symbol of romance and fertility. These things have roots, pun intended, of course. In medieval times, bobbing for apples was flirty. It was their version of speed dating, dare I say. What happened was all the leftover apples from the big harvest were then put into a big bucket. Each apple had a villager's name on it, and then maidens would have three chances. Three chances to grab that apple with their teeth. Three chances to win a date with the English Tad Hamilton. What a weird time. Can you imagine if this was in Game of Thrones? Reek is just shivering for two seasons, bobbing for Ramsay's Bolton apples. We're like, medieval times were dark, holy sh**. Number six. The feudal system, aka feudalism, was a form of structure system existing in medieval Europe in which people would work and fight for nobles who gave them protection and land in return. A social political system in which landowners would contractually bind tenants to exchange their goods, loyalty, and simple space for safety and comfort within the laws of those ruling. Basically, this is like our renters agreement now. I'll give you a place to stay and some heat. You give me an unfathomable and overpriced amount of shillings for these extremely low ceilings. Yeah, talk about crooks, man. This system stayed in place for more than a thousand years and managed to fizzle its way out of society somewhere in the 15th century. Not just anybody would ask to be signed to this deal. There was structure and there was order. There was a lord, AKA the landowner, AKA your landlord, allowing vassals, AKA tenants, to rent the land by providing services especially military services. Yeah, you can stay here, but once in a while, we're gonna need you to dump a bunch of boiling water and over that wall. Is that cool? Yeah, you're fine with that. The plot of land, called a fief, was typically worked on by serfs, who were laborers, who had very few rights and were bound to the land itself. These were the lowest class of people, and they basically did any and all to stay safe on the Lord's land. Jobs would include farming, jobs would include cleaning, and was a minimum of three days work to maintain a good standing and remain stationary. Ah, sure, there was no dental or mental health days, but come on. A three day work week? Plant a couple carrots here and there? Hey, it doesn't seem that bad. Number five, fear the dead. With The Walking Dead on their 47th season, I think it's time to take a peek into zombie history, shall we? And find out where this grim idea really started. Well, it's certainly not a new one, I'll tell you that for free. As far back as the early 1300s, residents were buried in the village of Warren Percy, where archeologists discovered them many moons later, and they discovered marks on their bones. Cuts, burn marks, you name it. Apparently this was all done after they had passed away. But why? Scientists believe that these injuries inflicted after their untimely death were to prevent them from being reanimated. You know, coming back to life and haunting your village. To keep them in their graves, of course. Unless this dude did something to piss off an entire village that much, they were clearly afraid of this corpse coming back to haunt them. Number four. Studia Generali. This period also saw the birth of what we call the modern university. This was a culmination of material translated and taught to provide a new infrastructure to scientific scholars. Some of these new universities were registered by the Holy Roman Empire as an institution of international excellence, giving it the title Studium Generali, or better known as Studia Generale. Most of the early Studia Generale were discovered in Italy, Spain, England, and France. These places of study were considered the most prestigious places of learning in all of Europe. I bet you this school hoodies were still so expensive. Just someone's old textbook with a mustache drawn on Marcus Aurelius. The list and number of institutions began to grow as new universities were founded throughout Europe. As early as the 13th century, scholars from the Studia Generali were encouraged to speak and lecture courses at other institutions within Europe to share documents and information which led to the current academic culture seen in modern universities today. It's a TED talk, come on. There had to be one cool professor back then, like the guy who lets the class teach itself, orders pizza, has tenure, and hates the monarchy. Number three, tavern history. Before the Middle Ages, there were still taverns, places where alcohol was sold. Of course, this goes back thousands of years. Taverns, believe it or not, existed during ancient Roman days. In ancient Greece, the Lesh, which was a fancy club, had served food to its members as well as strangers. So it was the first tavern, essentially. Ancient Greek taverns as well. Imagine making ale in flip-flops. 
and like a little toe guy. I'd be so, I'd be dancing around. It'd be so light and just, ah, it wouldn't actually be horrible. It sounds like a horrible job. The Code of Hammurabi from ancient Babylonia, so around 1750 BCE, even all the way back then, they had the death penalty in place for those who improperly diluted beer. Imagine losing your head because you threw in too many hops. I'm like, ah, uh, oops. Did you see him take a sip? He's like, mmm. They're like, oh, please. Number two, drink ale responsibly. The night is beginning to wind down. There's a guy in a piccolo playing closing time in the corner. It's, you know, it's time to hit the road. We're feeling it. Stools are going up. We're, you know, some guy's wiping something off something. How dangerous are these drunken commutes at this point? Well, back in ye olden days, there wasn't a friendly server that made sure you had some water before calling you a cab. No, in the 14th century, ale was three gallons for a penny. Nobody was cutting you off. They're like, yep, keep going. Give us your pennies, sir. Ooh, down your throat. In 1276 in Elsto, a man named Osbert Le Whale came home from a local tavern just extremely intoxicated, not looking good. So much so that he fell and hit his head on one of the many stones around his house and then, well, Bob's your uncle. Yeah, get home safe. If you're gonna drink, do responsibly and get home completely safe. And finally, number one, the ride home. Like I just said, this was a lawless time. People would go to the tavern, slam tons of ale, and then just ride a horse home. Like it was, Fine? Yeah, not a great idea at all. This is drunk driving back in the day. More often than not, these guys would fall off or get lost or pass out on their horse and just end up in a different place. Imagine an unconscious knight strolling through a village at 6 a.m. You're like, that's Eric. That's literally Prince Eric. He's gone, he's asleep. In the early 1300s, it was pretty common for your husband to just not return at all. He would just leave the bar with the lantern, not see the well in front of him, trip, fall in, and drown. Like. You couldn't see anything, this was street lights back then. What a way to go out, horrible. There was one report of a man who was on his way home from the local tavern. He had to go to the washroom, break the seal, classic. So he decided to pull over and then go and relieve himself in the pond. But during so, he fell in and then drowned. Yeah, so back then it was just a bunch of drunk guys walking around uneven roads. So yeah, accidents are bound to happen. Guy's not even intoxicated. He's like, God, this road sucks. Yeah.